Welcome to a slightly damp sunrise safari here on Juma Private Game Reserve. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Viam, aka the Wildebeest, on camera. Uh, James Henry, Stefan Winterboer, and Brian Joubert shall be on foot a little later when it gets light enough for them to depart. So, guys, apparently the lions were at the at the cam for three to four hours. Now which way did they go? Please let me know if you know which direction the lions went. I'm gonna go down there to let you know which direction is which to avoid confusion. Or maybe they're still lying up close by with that belly full of buffalo. So we're gonna go, I'm gonna go park myself in front of the camera and uh, just to make sure everyone knows which way is north, south, east and west. But what an amazing sunset safari that I wasn't even on. You guys had Karula, you had the Incahumas, but I think um, Nicola Austin and myself won uh, while sitting at home listening to a few alarm calls. We wandered out and we happened to see the cheetah chasing Impala. So, no, I'm only teasing. Hopefully we might be able to find that uh, cheetah a little later today. Okay, so I'm approaching the pan now. There is a single impala and the putrefier of the pan, Pete the Pond Hippo, who has probably defecated half a ton of uh, waste into the pan. So there we go, I'm right in front of the camera now. And if you watch from where I'm going, I'm not gonna do exact directions, uh, but the pan is behind me. There's Peter the putrefier. And, oh, what I heard a lion. Nope. So if you're looking directly at Peter the Putrefier, that is more or less north, directly over Peter, uh, back towards the Vuyatella Lodge is west. And of course, to where the light is starting in the sky is east, so directly behind us is east, and back towards the top of quarantine is south. So let me know which way uh, the felines went. I'm guessing they might have gone down Twin Dam, so that's where I'm going to start, unless you guys tell me different. And let me know via email. Uh, on questions at wildearth.tv or if you're a little bit more tech savvy, pop out a tweet and just attach the hashtag Safari Live to it. It's this incredible crisp smell this morning. There's been the minutest bit of rain. I would say we probably didn't get half a millimeter, but it has been enough to dampen the dust and give us that wonderful fresh feeling. You can see I'm wearing a jersey and that doesn't happen often at this time of the year. We've also decked out the vehicle in all the rain gear. And of course, as we drive out, the rain stops, so enough of that. And it is going to make tracking a little bit difficult. So we're going to go very slowly to see if we can see those lion tracks. Let me know if I'm actually going in the right direction. Oh, why, thank you, Dan. It seems like my hunch is correct. Lions last seen moving the direction of Twin Dam Road. And here we are meandering down Twin Dam's Road. Also, those who are watching the cam will have seen I have a small human sitting next to Viam. The small human's name is Leanne, and she's new to our team. There we go, oh, Viam. <laughs> oh, she's hiding. <laughs> and if she misbehaves on the vehicle today, I am going to feed her to the lions. If not, we'll just leave her in the bush somewhere. 
But let's carry on. So if you hear any strange noises or squealing, I apologize. It's Leanne. She's got on Vildi and I's nerves, and we've decided to abandon her in the bush. So Leanne has come down from the head office in Johannesburg uh, to help out in the final control. But I think this is Leanne's first drive. Yes, it is. Leanne's first drive, so we'll try to scare her as much as possible. Okay, so we're coming up to a road intersection here, and that is where we're going to check carefully for tracks. As I said, we're going to have to check extremely carefully in this low light and slightly damp <coughs> weather we're experiencing. see anything just yet. They might have cut through into the drainage. What I'm going to do is I'm going to head off towards Chelepan. We get nothing there. Cross the Mawati River system and then head back along Central. Every now and then I'm going to be switching off the vehicle to listen. Not only to the wonderful birds of the dawn chorus, but more hopefully to the roaring of big cats. As we speak about roaring of big cats, who can tell me what uh, is the reason big cats can roar and small cats can meow? And you can do that by popping me an email at questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Catfish has also said that now we have such a great debate that the lines were heading southwest. Well, we're heading south, west is over there, so it is possible they moved up onto quarantine. I didn't see any tracks, I, I won't lie. I wasn't looking too carefully before my coffee this morning and I left Inga's house uh, to head to the DRC. So it is possibly worth doing an extra loop. Instead of going north, we can go west. See if we've got any tracks there. So it sounds like James has managed to pull himself out of bed, lazy, what not, and is getting ready. Uh, shortly, we'll be ready uh, to take you on a cool, crisp bushwalk. Of course, I recommend you ask him why he's so late this morning. Why is he up so late? He should be up earlier. I'm only playing the reason, of course, the bushwalk doesn't start as early as the drives, as it is dark, and one would not want to stumble into the Inkahumas in the, the black of night because you will go from dominant diurnal predator to lion feces quite quickly. to see a ghost. I wonder what this ghost could be. Now, look at that. I saw the white ghost. So obviously there is a communal nest spider that is spread nest. It's spread all over the tree. But with there's the them's got the center of the nest there. But with this a bit of moisture, the drizzle we had earlier, it has made all the webs incredibly beautiful. 
quite eerie in this low light. Suddenly you see this white ghost staring at you through the bushes. But not a ghost, just a communal nest spider. There we go. Filled with little drops of moisture. Now, you actually might find quite a few different species utilizing the fact that those, uh, those spider webs have caught the moisture. Uh, different birds and insects even will risk going close to those spiders just to have a drink. Let us see what's happening out and about on the Game Drive channel. Good morning, mobile stations, route and updates, please. I've got a feeling we're the only ones out. And it's just us. We have this wonderful wilderness wonderland to play in all on our own. Morning, oh, Ephraim's up. Uh, morning, F. Uh, no updates just yet. There's reports of Nkoma's heading south and west from Voyatella. I'm checking Twindam through to Chelepan, then I'll check Fulamons. Everything here? little bit of dampness we experienced this morning was not nearly enough to actually wet the earth and a quick scuff of the shoe will reveal dry dust underneath and even though it felt a little bit chilly earlier on this morning and I put my jersey on I am now thinking that was possibly not the best idea and can you believe it's 5.30 in the morning and it's 26 degrees Celsius which is 70-something odd to Fahrenheit. So I'm going to stay with me as I go around the next corner because you never know what's around the next corner. And in this case, I think it is a single Impala. And uh, let's have a look at the single Impala. And while we do that, we can go jump on foot. Oh, it's not a single Impala. It's a multiple Inyala, some female Inyala. There we go, mom and the baby. So not the kitty cats we were hoping for. And as they move back towards the Mawashi River system, let's go see what Master Hendry is up to on Shank's Pony. Good morning, good morning everybody from this a, a sort of drizzly and very pleasantly grey morning here in the low felt of the northeastern corner of South Africa. We're sitting at 395 metres above sea level. Multiply that by 3.25 to get to feet. It's too early in the morning for my brain to be achieving that sort of mathematical feat at this stage. Our plan this morning and you are on a live walk in the same way that you're on a live drive with Brent, so you can send us questions and comments as we go along. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Our plan this morning is to head off in this direction here, and what we're hoping to find is tracks of that cheetah from yesterday. Now, a cheetah is imminently viewable on foot, which means because it is, well, they're not that nervous of us on foot, A, and B, they pose no danger to us. So it's a bit like viewing wild dogs on foot, and slightly more nervous of us on foot than wild dogs are, but it does mean that if we can see the cheetah on foot, we should be able to have a wonderful sighting. Now, cheetah move big distances, so I don't want to get your hopes up. I don't want to get my own hopes up as we go along. That is our general idea. We'll look at some small stuff as we go along the plot way and see what we can find. We're in a huge clearing here called Quarantine Clearings, and that's the general plan of the after morning. It's not afternoon, but it is somewhere in some parts of the world, of course. Then there are some impala up ahead, so we're going to go and see if we can have a look at those. Now, my name is James Hendry. For those of you who do not know, on camera today, you will notice the camera is hanging at an angle that looks like it's being suspended from a high balloon. It is not. It is being suspended from the hands of all six foot three of Brian Joubert. That is why the angle is so particularly high. Six foot four, sorry. I took an inch off him. He's also wearing some substantial boots, so we're probably looking at six foot five this morning. There was some lovely drizzle 
and unfortunately I think it's probably going to disappear, which is sad, but just a lovely smell of that petrichor, delicious smell of the earth just smelling up into us. Now Ashley, you're in North Carolina, where I believe it probably is after afternoon, in the evening, and you would want to see something like a snake skin. I will try and find you one, I will do my best. The best place to look are in short, sort of short zizifus or buffalo thorn trees. They tree, those trees are particularly um, well used by snakes to take their skin off. I'm just trying to get a view of the sun here. And what they do is, of course, a snake will get into a thorny tree and then hook the old skin into the thorns and then kind of wriggle out of the skin and reveal the new skin and then leave the old skin behind. And that's what happens. Normally starts at the lips and finishes, oh my goodness, and finishes at the tail. Look at that. Isn't that just too beautiful? Red in the morning, shepherd's warning, Brian. Isn't it lucky that neither of us are shepherds? Indeed. Neither of men nor animals. So I'm just going to be quiet for a little while and I want you to absorb, if you can, the atmosphere of this perfect African dawn. Of course, you won't be able to hear what I can hear, but it's just another silent dawn chorus, or not silent, but very subdued. The slow movement of the dawn symphony with many of the orchestra on some kind of sabbatical at the moment. One or two first violins, a second violin or two, a couple of violas. We've got Drongo on violin, We've got one or two grey-headed sparrows sparsely covering the entire woodwind section. The lone tuba of the ground hornbill that we saw also alone yesterday. Bow, 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 bow. Now Brent Leo Smith of course would also like us to look for lion tracks as we go along. Obviously we will definitely be looking for lion tracks. Um, he is headed off in that direction there. Our idea is to sort of head towards where we had the cheetah yesterday and maybe the two will meet. Well, the tracks might meet. A cheetah likes nothing less than he likes a lion. And in fact, the, it's very unusual that we suddenly have the cheetah and the, le and the lions for the same time. Hello D. Phillips, a very good valid question while we wander along here. You want to know why on earth a cheetah would be no threat to us when a leopard might be and a lion might be. Um, D. I, they just don't react to us in the same way, you know. They have been domesticated before and so it's not impossible to, they just don't see us as something to um, how do I best describe this? So let's, let's go to what a lion and a leopard, how they react to us. They don't see us as something to eat, but they do see us as a threat. They're much more afraid of us, and they're much less likely to relax with us on foot than our cheetah. Cheetah, I think possibly because they, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know why it, why it should be, but they are certainly much less threatened. They are as threatened by us, but much less likely to kind of, uh, where, where, where a threat situation with the leopard and the lion could escalate into some kind of conflict where they would charge, a cheetah's response is almost always to just run away. Unless they're prepared to stand and they get quite used to you on foot and then they just get on with things. I don't really know why they should be entirely so different. Oh, listen. Lion's calling. Let me just call Brent quickly on the radio. Christine, you're in North Carolina and you want to see a dung beetle. Why? Well, you might be lucky because we've had a little bit of rain. Very difficult to find them in the absence of rain. Let me call Brent on the radio. Brent, you copy Brent. Why? 
Brent, audio of Lions to the east. Um, I'm not sure how far east. Uh, copy, I'm doing down Mumbai Junction. What would you recommend? I didn't get that audio. I would go all the way to the Cheetah Cut Line and listen there. Hi, here. Thank you very much. Okay, there's some Impala just behind us. And they're just walking through there. And as they walk along the clearing, Let's go across to Brent. He is heading towards where I heard those lions calling. You heard me say that I think they're in the east towards the rising sun. He's on his way there. Let's catch up with him. So one of the biggest benefits about having a commander Bond wandering around the foot is that without the vehicle noise, he's able to hear audio of lions and and other creatures much better than we can from the vehicle. And so he's let me know that there are lions calling to the east. So we're gonna shoot straight down to the southern boundary and then head due east towards the rising sun and not to the land of the rising sun, which is of course Japan, but the two cheetah cut by. Perhaps even in that quarry or around there. Copy, thanks very much. Uh, morning, Abel. Uh, there's Bodio and Gala somewhere to the northeast of Vuyatela. I'm on Twin Dams. I'm going to take Gary May and Chile Cutline to follow up. Uh, at about 11 o'clock last night, the Kormas were still around Vuyatela. I haven't found any tracks yet. And apparently there was not Gala at Sydney's Machi last night as well. So just chatting to Abel, who's getting mobile okay, buffers up. Very much. And uh, if he finds anything interesting, he'll also let me know. So the Birmingham's, I wonder, for those who you watch all these cameras everywhere, uh, if the Birmingham's are still on that hippo carcass to the east of us. I wonder, wonder, wonder. Could they be on the move? Kathy in Seattle and a few others who have got the reason lions can and other big cats like leopards can roar. Uh, they all have a flexible hyoid apparatus or hyoid bone. So it is a bone in the throat and in big cats it is basically like cartilage. It's like a little elastic thing and when they push air through it, it vibrates and that is what gives us that incredible sound. In little cats, uh, the hyoid is solid, so they're unable to push air across it to make it vibrate. That's why a lion goes, and a domestic cat goes, meow. Sharon has been paying attention to my many stories and she says she thought lions roar because the scrub hair covered the lions in honey and the bees thought the lion was the naughty one who raided their hive and stung him and due to the pain he cried out in anger and that's where he got his roar and is a little African folklore we discussed on the drive a few days ago. If you guys behave, I might tell you another African folklore too. So a very warm welcome as we head due east towards the rising sun to BJ from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. And she's asking, is it true that lions can either roar or purr and not do both? That is correct. The ones who have the modified hyoid apparatus or hyoid bone are able to roar. The ones that don't are able to purr. So are all the animals we saw on yesterday's safari, lions and leopards can't purr, but a cheetah can. So 
Joe is in New York is touching something incredibly interesting. And it's, is there a big difference between the home ranges or territories of the big cats, specifically lion, leopard, or cheetah? Most definitely, out of all of those, leopard have the smallest. They have a core territory, and, and then they have a home range. The boundary of the home ranges can be quite porous, and you can have different leopards that will cross in and out, specifically uh, with the males. But the core part of their home range is very exact. Just very pretty. Thought I saw a silhouette across uh, the skyline there quickly, or the horizon. Uh, and in the Sabi Sands, or in the northern Sabi Sands, your average male territory is about three to four thousand hectares, so up to about eight, nine thousand acres. Uh, a female in the northern Sabi Sands is around a thousand to two thousand hectares, so about five thousand acres. Uh, a lion has a, a group of male lions will have a much bigger territory, so the Birmingham's probably cover 15 to 20,000 hectares in total. And uh, the different lion prides, the female prides, have about 8,000 hectares. And a cheetah is the one animal that doesn't have a set territory, but a very large home range. And that's one of the reasons we see cheetah so rarely and so Cheetah can wander massive distances, and a cheetah home range can be 30,000 hectares for males uh, and females as well. Now, out of all the big cats in the world, cheetah are very unique in a lot of ways, and when it comes uh, to their mating and breeding and social structure, they're the most unique in the fact that all other big cat species need a female dominated sort of number so you will have more females than males oh hello oh no it's just a hyena but we'll discuss how a cheetah's mating strategies differ from all the big cats a little later i'm going to eat some earth to get towards where those lions were roaring while we do that james is stalking up on some prey species Pokey Franklins are calling all over the place, echoing just down through that drainage line, the leaves there, and there you can see a herd of impala and a zebra's bottom, and they're very skittish. They were alarm calling at us, they took one look at Brian's backpack, they ran up and down this clearing, you can hear them going, well you probably can't, but they're going, psh, 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 that's their little alarm call that they're making, so something's up. With them, I mean, it is certainly that they see us as predators, so they're a bit nervous of us, but we're not behaving like predators now. We are standing upright. We're not ducking behind something and trying to sneak up on them, and that definitely makes them a slightly more relaxed. But you can see they are watching us quite carefully. Now, what we're going to do is sneak slightly closer. I think there are tracks of the lions around here, and I've no doubt that these, this is the herd that the cheetah was chasing yesterday. And so they're probably a little bit nervous. Their blood is a bit up. And of course, they're frolicking in the reveling, in the joy of this magnificently moist morning that we don't normally have around here. I see the, the sun is coming up and possibly burning away the cloud already, which is a bit sad. But I'm sure that these animals are extremely excited by the fact that we have a little bit of rain. Here they go. Hello, Tara Psogna. Very nice to hear from you. I'm not sure if I've heard from you before, Tara Psogna. You say, how often do cheetah have their kills stolen by other predators? I think more than 50% of the time is the statistic, Tara. I think more than 50% of the time the hard-won gains that cheetah make are stolen either by lions, hyenas, leopards, even wild dogs might scavenge a fresh one off a cheetah. 
and jackals and even vultures can steal from cheetah. I just watched one of them over there doing that kind of stotting motion that happens when they're chased by something nasty. Let's just keep going down this way. Raid Freak, if I can understand your question correctly, I think you're asking, um, do the herbivores ever have any land conflict with other herbivores? Is that correct? I'm just going to get Nikki to confirm that. Right, major land disputes. So, um, so inter-specific competition is what you're asking about. So that's competition between different species of animals and do any of the herbivores ever have that? They do over water raid freak, not so much over grazing land. So you would have seen there that the uh, zebra and the impala were happily getting on with things together. And indeed the zebra were probably hanging around the impala because of the extra eyes that they provide. They eat slightly different things. Zebra are long grass eaters. Uh, impala mixed feeders where they will eat short grass and even uh, fresh leaves like this on the apple leaf here. So they, don't, they wouldn't compete necessarily over land, but certainly over water. That's when uh, tempers start to fray, especially in a drought like this, tempers will fray and animals will start to fight with each other over water, especially elephants. Elephants really don't like their, their water being drunk by anyone else. So we've seen them chasing, uh, what have we seen them chasing? Buffalo, we've seen them chasing hippo, we've seen them chasing the old Nyala away from the Juma Dam pan. And we also, yesterday, Scott was out on drive and he had a very, more well, slightly amusing sighting of some zebra chasing warthogs away from Sydney's dam. So yes, over water, over grazing and land, I wouldn't say so, not so much. Intra, specifically, so that means within the species, so impala themselves, would they fight with each other? Yes, the territorial ones will. So the males will. That's not so much over land as it is over mating rights, and I'm trying to think of others that would fight over land specifically. Um, I suppose wildebeest bulls, when they're territorial, they might fight over land specifically. They like to have a piece of shade, a bit of water, and a rubbing post, and they will protect that quite heavily. So intra-specifically, yes. Inter-specifically, not so much. <gasps> What a long explanation. Mm, now, Debbie, you obviously I mentioned the fact that that impala there was doing that stotting thing there, and you wanted to know. You smell that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <sighs> um, Debbie. I'm just going to stop here because it's a wonderful smell. Debbie, you want to know, you obviously saw the impala doing a stotting there, and you want to know if impala will alarm call the cheetah, like they don't at wild dog. At wild dog, they normally just run away at a great speed, uh, and they do that stotting motion where they sort of kick their back legs out, and they show how fit and strong they are in an attempt to dissuade the wild dogs. Debbie, they will do both. Uh, Nikki had them doing both yesterday, and I've certainly seen them alarm calling a cheetah. Uh, it's mainly because cheetah are a bit more considered than wild dog. So if they do see a cheetah, they will absolutely congregate together and go and look for the cheetah and make sure they can find where it is. A cheetah's best bet for catching something is when it starts to run. Wild dog doesn't care if it's standing still or running. They'll just run up to it and uh, basically tear it to pieces, which of course a cheetah cannot do. Now there's a smell of sort of... Um, it's almost a herby smell around here, a bit of mint in the air, and something has been released by the little bit of moisture that we've had last night. Now, what I want to show you as we're walking along here is the amount of rain that we've had. Now, I mean, many people think that we measure rain in inches, well, I mean, in, in milliliters. So in the imperial system, we, we, we refer to rain measurements in millimeters. So it's, it's actually a length measurement. It's not a volume measurement, which is different from you know, most of the time when you're measuring liquid. And what that means is how far down into the surface, how many inches or millimeters did the rain sink into the surface. And if you look here, not very far at all, less than one millimeter. So, I mean, a f tiny fraction of an inch we had last night. But the smell here is quite wonderful. It's coming out of the soil here. 
the water has released this, it's called petrichor, as uh, many of our viewers have taught me over the last year or so. The smell of, I think it's, um, I think it's a bacteria actually, that gets released from the soil once the rain comes. It is just beautiful. And you can see little bits of droplets of water on the ends of the leaves shining in the new sun. Now, a Twitter handle on the prowl, you want to know, <laughs> I love these Twitter handles, on the prowl, you want to know about giraffe and whether they wouldn't be around a herd. You seem to be under the impression that a herd of impala like that and zebra would lurk about with some giraffe because the giraffe are obviously very tall like Brian and they can see predators much close, much more closely. To a certain extent, yes, I suppose they might, but remember they eat totally different things. So for them to follow each other completely, they would find it very difficult to find enough to eat. So if the giraffe were around, I've no doubt that the impala would would look to where they were looking if um, they became alarmed, but no, it's, there isn't this kind of symbiotic relationship like that, as far as I know. Thank you very much on the prowl. Let's head across to Brent. I'm sure he's getting close to where we heard those lions calling. We'll get an update from him. We're going to head into the thicket over here. So we are still eating the earth, and uh, James and Steph fought the lions when this general area. So I've slowed down now and I'm just checking very carefully for tracks. And hopefully we'll see a paw print or three. And if we get no luck and the lions happen to be to the east or the north of us, apparently there were some unknown lions in Sydney's dam. So that definitely is worth an inspection. Is it the Nkawumas who managed to sneak past us? Or is it a new pride that has moved in from the Manuleti due to the drought? I'm hoping for a new pride. Always exciting to see new animals. I always check carefully at these junctions of roads for tracks. Veritable highways for lions and leopards. Especially after a little bit of rain. They're not going to be wanting to get their paws too wet, so much better to walk down the road. in Germany, B-O-R-O, -O. sorry about that, Bor borrow, 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 sorry if we're getting our name wrong here, yeah? uh, but who lives in Germany, in Berlin, and so new to the channel, well, a very big welcome to you, uh, been watching for two days, loving it, me too, I also love it, and uh, we're on the search for big cats, and would like to know whether we live in the wild. We do. Uh, we have two camps at the moment, and the camp that I live in is, uh, seems to be snake capital of the Sabi Sands. I think we've had about nine different, ten different species of snakes so far. The other camp seems to be the rodent capital of the Sabi Sands. Some corrugations. So we do, uh, we live out here for six weeks at a time. So pretty much it is home for most of us. Uh, and then we have two weeks of holiday every six weeks. And we are incredibly lucky and privileged to be able to live in an amazing area like this. And if you were watching yesterday's sunset safari, uh, it was my evening off and I was sitting with Nikki at our house next to the swimming pool and we heard some impala alarming and some squirrels alarming and we went off to the back of the house and we got to see a cheetah chasing impala right next to the house and we often have elephant around the house, lion, leopard, um, the occasional hippo who tries to climb into our swimming pool and that would be Peter from the 
the, the pan, he decided our swimming pool looked better and we had to make sure he didn't get into the swimming pool. So yes, we do live out here in the middle of the bush and we wouldn't want it any other way. Okay, so we're now getting into the hot zone where we think those lions were, or James and Steph said the calls were coming from. ground so oh hang on let's just check down the road quickly first and Lev who's in Brooklyn you can see the moisture in the air this morning he's saying um we've heard lion contact calls but we've never heard a lion actually roar and apparently in capital letters well lions don't really rah! They're more. So that's a line that roar. So the only time you hear that sort of and more like that is when they're fighting over a carcass or mating or fighting amongst each other, um, whether it be for mating rights with males or defending their territory against other males or females fighting over a carcass or against other females. So. The lion roar we hear the most is that. And uh, that is to proclaim territory or to find each other. A uh, lion contact call is actually something very different. If, you, if, if we hear a lion contact call, it's a very soft ow, ow, ow. So very, very different. And the perception of that is definitely from Hollywood and not from reality, Lev. But who knows, hopefully we'll have the lion roaring next to us very shortly. So I'm not even going to turn the car on. I've put it into neutral and we're going to sidle down the hill. And that gives my ears a better chance to hear what's about. And we're also going to be checking very carefully for tracks. So, a very a good morning to Elizabeth in Minneapolis. Uh, Elizabeth would like me to tell the story of what my dad and grandfather used to tell me when I was a small child living in the bush about what a lion says when he calls. So, just, oh, I think I've accidentally there we go, put on the windscreen wipers. You can see they're very effective. So, Elizabeth, just for you. Um, so when I was a small child, and I've pretty much lived in the bush my whole life, and my dad and grandpa used to tell me and ask us as kids, what does a lion say? What does a lion say? And a lion says, whose land is it? Whose land is it? It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. And for us as kids, we used to love that, and it's, it's a really good way, I suppose, of teaching us, even from a young age, that a lion is proclaiming territory and telling all the other lions around not to come there because this is his land. I was hoping they would, on cue, start roaring, but no such luck, so we're gonna have to do it the old-fashioned way and find some footprints. Just gonna get a little bit of speed before I... There we go. So while we look for the tracks of the largest and most well-built of the African cats. James has got the track of the slightest built of the African big cats. Hello everybody, Zoe, you wanted to see a cheetah track, there it is. Here is a cheetah track going the opposite direction from where we expected it to go. Brian spotted it and here it is. 
And you can see not very distinct, of course, because it is underneath the rain from last night. And Ray, I use the term rain in its loosest possible way. Three lobes here. Can you see my stick, Brian? Yep. Three lobes. The back. Obviously, the four toes. Much more extended than a leopard track, for example. And if I touch it, you can feel there is a crust from the rain on top of it. So I'll break it up for you now. There's that crust. So it's well under the rain. So when we were trying to find it last night, I suspect he came through here and continued his way north towards actually the Juma Dam Pan. Now our idea is to head towards there now where an elephant bull was just seen. So that's going to be our plan from here. And I just want to quickly show you this amazing thing here. This is a dung ball. A tiny little dung ball obviously hardened, rolled by a dung beetle and unearthed sometime last night by a honey badger, which is very interesting. So inside here will be the lava of the little dung beetle. So I know you wanted to see a dung beetle, Ashley, I think it was. And um, well, this is my, probably the closest we're going to get, I'm afraid. So dung ball, let's go back to Brent. We'll continue towards the elephant and these cheetah tracks. Keep you posted on the way. We're still sidling down the hill, stopping every now and then. This is what we can hear. So out in the bush, quite often, your ears will find you an animal long before your eyes will. So that's why it's very important to use your ears carefully. Some zebras. jumpy. Now, how's that? For a black and white animal, the camouflage is quite good. You can see the tail keeping the flies away. James Robinson has asked a question that I'm quite fond of. And when we get to it in a second, I just want to check these tracks here. And it is a hyena track. Quite fresh. Oh, can you see it there? Well, here, my too close. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, and you can see how fresh it is. It's broken the soil. You can see it's on top of the rain. Well, rain is a strong word for what we had. Heading down towards the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Or oh, what is, was the Buffalo's Hook waterhole? It seems like an age ago. But to answer Jan Robertson, we're just going to have to get a little bit closer to these striped donkeys here. Um, how's that for the stallion at the back there? You got him? Uh, yeah. So uh, he's a bit hiding behind the bush. And James Robertson, as I said, asked the question I'm quite fond of. Uh, what is the difference between a quokka and a zebra? Are they relations? Are they subspecies? Or completely separate species? Well, James, a quokka is a zebra. It's an, inst an extinct form. to set them off on a panic. Could there be a lion atop the hill? Let's have a quick look. I don't think so, but I think that was more nerves than anything else. Let's just have a quick look. You never know. And so, James, James, your plain zebra is called Equus Burcelli. Quacha is the scientific name. So a quokka is actually, from genetics, just a color variant on the normal plain zebra. Uh, there's lots of different variants of plain zebra all over the place, uh, but they are, in the end, the same species. So there is a program which I find absolutely fascinating in the Karoo National Park, where they are trying to breed that color variant back. So 
So any zebra who had a slightly white bottom, less stripes than normal, uh, was put into that breeding program. And it is actually working. I was quite flabbergasted, but when I visited the Karoo National Park in the center of South Africa, uh, they are busy bringing quaggas back from extinction. Uh, it is actually just a plains zebra or a virtual zebra, uh, just a slight color variation on it. No lines atop the hill, no lion tracks thus far. But we're going to keep moving slowly. You can see those lovely fresh prints just shining on the road in front of us. But so far, we have done the whole eastern boundary, a bit of the southern, and we're on the north, and no tracks leaving Juma. So, we're on the prowl, and on the prowl, on Twitter would like to know, does purring mean cats are necessarily happy? Um, it is a sign of contentment. So yes, I would say if a cat is purring, it is happy. There have been some interesting studies say uh, in wild or zoo populations that sometimes cats will purr, some of the smaller cats will purr to placate a more dominant cat that's close by. So uh, a male who's upset, a female will purr to placate them. But normally uh, when a cat purrs, it is very content. Yep. Any big fat kitty tracks? Nope. James Richard. And James says, oh, I would love to see a giant lion snail if it's rained, one of my favorite rain-loving critters. Uh, uh, James, I'm afraid I don't think it's rained enough to bring out the snails, but I will keep a very close eye out for one, and so shall Viam. So Steph seemed to think that lion audio came from the quarry. Oh, but there was a bird. It's just gone. Oh, it's coming back. No, it's gone. It's gone. No, it's, oh. no, it's gone. Sorry about that. Uh, this bird was looping around. It was an African grey hornbill. But while we continue to check extensively on the northern frontier, uh, let's jump back to James. He's getting his morning's exercise. Now I'm standing upon this termite mound as a kudu might, showing myself to the wilderness, demonstrating all five feet and eight inches of me, the enormous plover-like legs that I have sticking out of my large shorts. I'm not only standing here for that purpose, I am standing here, of course, because we heard an elephant herd in here. We heard a herd. <laughs> And then over here to the other side, there was an elephant bull that was seen on the Juma Dam cam and seemed to be heading this way. So I was trying to see if we could spot him. We're still going to try and spot him. But going along the road here are the lion tracks of the Inkahuma pride, I think. We found evidence of them chasing zebra last night somewhere around a quarantine clearings. And so that's what's going on down the road here. I don't know how close they would be. I know that Brent was asking for a giant land snail. When Brent requests, of course, I deliver. This is a giant land snail. So Richard, you were asking Brent for a giant land snail. Well, there he is. This one, of course, is no longer extant. It is expired. It is no longer. It is dead. Enormous giant land snail. They can live up to 10 years, believe it or not, 10 to 15 years. That's a long time for a snail, I would have thought. This one, I'm not sure how old this one was when it met its end. Let's put that back there. Let's carry on down here. 
And Lucy, you want to see a grasshopper. You're from South Bend in Indiana, which I always think sounds like a lovely place to visit. And you want to see a grasshopper. We will definitely try and find one. There's a nice lion track here that I just want to quickly show you. And I want to show you for the reason, not so much that it's a lion track, but it's because it's fresher than the cheetah. It's not fresh, but it is fresher than the cheetah. You can see there, there's a line in the moisture. I'm just drawing a square around the lion track. But you can see that there is some dryness there within that track. And that tells me that it was probably walking here during the course of the bit of the drizzle that we had. That cheetah was definitely before the drizzle. There isn't so much a crust on top of this track. That's a lioness. And just to give you an idea of the size, I suppose, she's about that size. Carry on. Come with me. That's not daily. Debbie, of course, we've chatted a lot about the fact that lions seem to have there's some oxpeckers calling, so we're going to just pay attention to where they lie down or sit to fly down. They're not going to lie down because they will, of course, sit on buffalo, and we don't want to frighten a buffalo. We are quite close to the Juma Dam camp. Debbie, you want to know if cheetah are able to take evasive action when their kills are being stolen? Uh, Debbie, no, they're not. They don't have the strength to pull up, uh, kill up a tree. They don't have the claws for it either. They will climb low trees sometimes, not vertical ones, but if they've got a bit of a slope, they can get up into quite high trees. Um, but they don't. Just watching carefully here. But they don't possess the strength to be able to take them up trees. They don't put their quickest defense against being eaten, of course. Their quickest defense against being eaten is to eat quickly. That's what they do. They eat as fast as they can. Look at the hornbill. Right here. The yellow bull hornbill that has landed there. And I can hear that lonely, lonely, mournful call of that single ground hornbill. Isn't that pretty? Now, Marianne, you want to do what the giant land snail does when it, there is rain. Um, a giant land snail, when there's rain, revels in it in the same way we do. They don't need to hang out at all. They've got a hangout. They carry their hangout with them. Oh, sorry, when there's a lack of rain, what do they do? They have their hangout in their shell, and then what they do is they form a crust over the edge and it kind of seals in the moisture of the shell and then they sit and hope not to get eaten basically is what happens when there isn't any rain. Now, we are not alone out here of course. We are with Stefan Winterboer who's um, operating security detail. He is uh, also what I like to term the mystic boer which means he's hiding most of the time but he has heard the elephants through here so we're going to carry on through here. quite exciting. Okay, let's head back across to Brent. We're going to try and get into a position where we are able to see the elephants. So while we're doing that, go across to Brent, get an update from him, and I'll keep you posted. So, uh, we are now still moving very slowly down the northern boundary, and unfortunately, I think the large elephant bull James is tracking. We've just spotted crossing the northern boundary. I'm trying to call him on the radio. James, James. Where did he go? Where did he cross? Yeah. Um, yeah. You got him. Oh, there he is. He's having a dust bath. Hello, big boy. Big boy is not being very helpful to us this morning because he is disappearing across the edge of our northern traverse area. And 
there is a large grey backside if I've ever seen one. I think he's listening to us. He stopped. He might have been offended about what I said. He's a nice big bull, adult bull, so definitely over 30, probably closer to 40. And he's going to disappear into the bush shortly. He's adding a fertilizer to the crest. Actually, here it hit the earth there with a thud. It's now adding nitrates to the soil, which we can also hear. I'll be able to get hold of James. I heard he had a lion track somewhere, so I just want to find out if he knows which way they're going. James, James. Okay. Sorry, guys, my microphone is coming loose. Can I have a bit more tape there, please, Ben? I need to make a longer sticky. There you go. Think that's going to work for him? Yeah, that looks like. There we go. Attaching the microphone. Thank you. Chatting about lions and lion tracks, and Brian Jurgensen on Twitter would like to know how can I tell the difference between a young male and a lioness? Well, from about a year and a half, a young male lion's tracks are already bigger than his mom's, and he's got a lot of growing to do normally into those tracks. Oh, there's a little diker running across the road. Skip and a jump. Vim showing his expert camera skills there, tracking that diker through the bush. Well, very positive note so far. We've traversed quite a lot of the boundary and we have not seen a single track departing. So it's a very strong possibility that the Inkagumas are still inside uh, Juma. So fingers crossed. We're going to keep checking just to make sure they haven't crossed and we're basically then going to slowly work our th way through. I know James is heading in the direction where those tracks are so I'm going to leave him on foot. I'm going to cover a wider area in case they've moved a bit further. We're also going to have a little Gander in Sydney's water holes as now. Of course, Jamie has got the Sydney's waxed every time she goes there. The creatures seem to appear out of nowhere. I'm hoping that a little bit of Jamie's luck will rub off on me. It's starting to get cold again debating whether to put my jersey on. It's a very welcome respite to all of us. Have a little cool weather. So, Iggy in Canada. Welcome on Safari Live. And you would like to know, does South Africa have a national bird, flower, animal, oh, more zebras, lots and lots of zebras about this morning. What are you 
you snorting at? bird alarming behind us. The zebra is staring quite intently. I'm just gonna double check. Often go away birds just be alarming at another predatory bird. But the fact that the zebra is staring in that direction means it could be something a little more interesting. But I think I know what the zebra was staring at. Paranoid zebra. Paranoid zebras and other animals. Oh, it's running, but there's a, another little gray diker that's disappearing, but we will double check a bit further on. Just a go away bird is alarming up here. Bam, you see anything? I see a an impala. So, no, there's just impala up here. So the go-away bird is probably alarming at something like a slender mongoose or another predatory bird species. wondering, has there ever been a solid-coloured zebra? And well, unfortunately, those zebras have departed for greener pastures. Uh, Paul, I've never seen a completely solid-coloured zebra. I've seen a very white zebra. Uh, leucism is the term. Any tracks there, Ben? Nope. So, Iggy, I will get back to your question shortly, but James has got something incredible to show you while creeping around on his own two feet. Well, we're going to try and show you, but we're sitting here in some pretty thick bush, and just to the south, you can see maybe some leaves moving there. There is a herd of elephants here. The rest of them are spread out off to the right hand side of your picture. Now, although you can't see them, we are not more than say, ooh, probably about 40 meters or so, 120 feet. We don't want to try and disturb them, of course, because the idea is to view them without them knowing that we are here. But I think that they're actually watching us, Brian. Just look to the right hand side. Okay, if you can see the elephant, that's fine. I'm just watching the one to the right of us. What I'm going to do is test the wind. The wind is good for us. The wind is fine for us at the moment. Now, for those of you who might be worried, for those of you who might be slightly worried about our safety, remember we are being very careful here. And we're checking the wind constantly. Now, even if these elephants saw us, I think they would be relatively comfortable because they can't smell us and B, because we are not sort of in some thick bush trying to hide from them. We're standing pretty much out in the open. But that said, to try and approach them closer, closer would possibly be to invite some kind of, not conflict, but certainly a, an engagement which we don't want to do. So I'm just going to stand up here, see if we can't get another view. They're really, they're not far away. They're just inside the bush here. But you can see bet between us and them, there's nothing in the way of a termite mound or some sort of high ground or cover that we can use in order to get a good view. So we think that that bull, can you see them there, Brian? So we think that bull that was seen at the Juma Dam cam is following this herd. That is very common. One of these elephants might be an oestrus, and that would encourage the bull, of course, to follow the herd in search of love. We are, of course, in the month of St. Valentine. Oh, 
Did you see the dust going puffed up there? There's an elephant through there just throwing some dust up into the air. Let's just try, maybe try and get a slightly better view. Now I'm going to test the wind, so watch carefully. The end of this sock that a friend gave me when I went to his wedding. You know, it's very nice when people give you gifts. Socks, I'm not so sure. So you can see the ash in the sock is blowing straight into the camera lens. Now that means that it's good. And animals react to our smell often far more than they do to the sight of us. So we're just going to move a little bit forward and see if we can't get a little view. Here is the excavation of an artfark as we move forward. So they are all around us. I can't see the entire extent of the herd. So we're going to move very, very slowly. There, I can see them moving through there. What we'll do, Brian, we're just going to go to the, that rootstock over there. OK, we're going to quietly, very slowly move to the rootstock. And you can see that I'm creeping along. Somehow an elephant manages to creep even more quietly than a human being. How that is possible, I just don't know. It's just so very aware of where their feet are falling. And they're also so very cleverly coloured and camouflaged. by now. And of course when you're viewing a herd of elephants like this you've got to keep looking around. They can spread out, they can be a bull following, they might just stumble across a buffalo. So you have to remember that they're not the only residents of the bush here. Uh, there's another one. So I mean we're right kind of in amongst them which is not the best place to be. Now the wind has changed so we're going to have to be very careful. Well, no, it hasn't changed. It does swing a little bit. It's, we're still OK. We'll keep testing the wind. A hardy dar calling, hoarsely. Obviously had a nice party last night. The smell is incredible. This beautiful petrichor smell. Brian, we were talking about we were talking about bird calls and the hardy dar call, and you have obviously heard us refer to the go away bird, and you want to know why it's called that. It's called that because it says quay, quay, which means go away, go away. That's why they're called the go away bird. It's an onomatopoeic term. Okay, let's get. You see this dead tree here, Brian. Let's turn around and get a nice view from there. We're going to try for one more view and then we'll hand you back over to Brent. It is just very thick and so to be approaching to be approaching elephants too closely in bush like this is not very smart. So we're just going to go up to this dead tree here try and get one more view and then we'll hand you back to Brent. Mm, can you see anything, Brian? Not a sausage. <laughs> still see them. They're just melting kind of through the bush here. I don't think that they're aware of us at this stage. We'll try and get into another viewing position, maybe get a better view, but otherwise let's go back to Brent, get an update from him, and I will see you shortly. What a marvellous sighting that was. So we're about to approach Sydney's waterhole, and there's some serious weather coming in across from the west. Hopefully we do get a bit more rain. 
but let's go have a look if there's any creatures at the water hole. So I wonder what's there. I'm sure you guys can guess. Um, VM apologizes, or I apologize on VM's behalf that he's gonna have to keep clearing the lens. We'll try to stay out for as long as possible, of course, but that does look like some quite heavy water coming. So, so Iggy was asking about South Africa's national birds, flowers, etc. And from Canada, where Iggy's from, they have a beaver, a loon, which is an aquatic bird for those who don't know, and a maple leaf. So our, our national bird is a, where have I put it now? A blue crane, and I will show you what a blue crane looks like shortly. It's a very, very pretty bird. Our national animal is the springbok, or springbok, and that is what our rugby team is called, the springboks. And our national flower is the protea, which our cricket team is called. And then each individual province will also have their own, their own different ones. And I don't have any, actually I might, Let's have a look what I've got in my box. Yeah, no, I don't have any pictures of proteas. So you're gonna have to Google the protea, but I'll show you what the national bird looks like. And there's a giraffe staring intently. Oh no, at Abel. Minjani! Morning, morning, morning. How you doing? Not dog, yeah. From the north. Is it from the north? I'm sure, yeah, but I can see that. So there's no Nkwanzo and Kumas coming out of Buyatela, so I think Not they long. went, last Nkwanzo was going into that block between Weaver's Nest and Quarantine. Okay. And the Shikankank also went in there yesterday, so yeah. I'll go back to that side and have a look. Okay, I'll just And then I think Kurula's got Nyama, but you can't get them over in there, off Gari Cutline, in that steep Shkova. Okay. Okay. Enjoy, guys. So, there are only some giraffe at Sydney's. And they off in the distance there. Morning is in Africa. There we go. VM's favorite animal. And you can see there, those are two females, and you can see the great color variation between the two, there's a third. And there's two females off to the right. Now, like I have brown hair and Vim has blonde mouse colored hair, uh, giraffe can be different colors, and it's a lot of people sometimes think it's to do with age. It's not just, in the, different individuals have different amounts of melanin in their skin. The same as some people, are pale and pasty, and some people are dark and tanned. So I heard a report there were lions around here last night. I'm not sure which lions they may be. But we'd come have a look. But on a very positive note, we've traversed nearly the whole northern boundary, and we do not have a single track departing from a Juma private game reserve. So, which means there's a strong possibility that the lions, the leopard, and the cheetah are still in residence. So I'm gonna move back down towards that area slowly and see if we have any luck. National bird. There we go. The blue crane. And it is a very pretty bird, very tall bird. 
but with most cranes. I just did this to me the other day. I somehow managed to get confused how to make this. There we go. That is their call. And oh, go away. Uh, they live on the high faults generally and nice open grasslands around the Drakensberg Mountains. And they are one of South Africa's endemics, so they don't occur anywhere else. You can hear a zebra calling. Somewhat almost as unpleasant as a crane call. But uh, I think there's a lot of zebra at the moment as they search for water and grazing. Now, Robin is wondering about that cheetah that was seen yesterday. And I did say I would explain cheetah territories and movements and mating in, in a little bit more detail a bit earlier. So Robin would like to know, is that cheetah possibly a young male trying to set up territory? Difficult to say. So cheetah have home ranges that are quite porous, so males will overlap regularly. And uh, they have vast home ranges. A cheetah can easily wander around, a male cheetah in particular, can easily run around 30, 40,000 hectares, 80,000 acres. They do have areas that they prefer, but on a whole, they're quite, they're semi-nomadic is the best way to describe. The only time they are actually in one place for an extended period is when a female has cubs, then she'll stay in an area for a while. But as I was saying, they have the most unique mating sort of strategy in, of all the big cats. They are the only big cat that needs a male bias in the system to be able to, to breed. So I'm just waving at uh, Candace and Edwin from the Sabi Sands as we move past their house. They're having their morning coffee, with which we rudely interrupted. So when I say they need a male bias, so every other big cat needs to have more females than males. And cheetahs the opposite. They need to be more males than females. And a female cheetah will often turn down four or five either coalitions or single males before they'll actually mate. And this is one of the reasons they're so endangered because they live in such vast home ranges that females often don't encounter males that often. So they need a male bias and so females will often walk straight past three or four males that are feeling amorous, completely ignore them and only go on average with the, it is the fourth or fifth male that they'll mate with. So it's very interesting, a completely different strategy from the rest of the, the big cats. And I know I've asked this question before, and I know we've got a lot of new viewers out there, so time to test your bush knowledge, folks. And I'm gonna ask you about metapopulations. So metapopulations is the largest population that holds the most genetic diversity. So where is the largest metapopulation of cheetah in Africa? And as a sub-question for bonus marks, in what other countries can you find cheetah outside of Africa? And if you know the answers to those questions, send your answers through to questions at wildair.tv or just simply use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. try and chat to James quickly. He's asking for an update of where I've wandered around this morning. James, James. I think 
he's ignoring me. Huh? There he is. Uh, James, I checked Twin Dams all the way through to uh, Gary Main and then east and then to the cut line. Done the whole of the northern boundary as well. I haven't had any tracks yet. No uh, Not that I could see, but it was um, quite dark while I was going down Twin Dams, but I did check quite carefully. Okay, copy. We've got them going south, east through the block between the Wallbridge Road and Twin Dams, um, probably during the rain. We'll keep an eye out there. Copy, thanks, James. I'm going to do Parler Road, Philemon's, and then maybe check Central a bit later. And we also have tracks in the Cheetah going into Quarry, northeast into Quarry Tito. We haven't found where they went. That was definitely last night then. Okay, copy, thanks. Um, I might check, do a little gander on Gallagher and uh, Gallagher shortcuts. Okay, so James has got tracks of the Incahumas heading southeast. So he's checking that area. I did check Twin Dams this morning. We didn't find any tracks coming out. So hopefully James has some luck and he can see some kitty cats while on foot. And also tracks of the cheetah. We're going to go have a little loop around that area. Maybe, fingers crossed, our biggest, biggest, our, our, our big cat luck is going to hold out. Sorry, I just thought I spied something there. Uh, I think those are the leopard tracks from yesterday. The rain is on top. Yeah, Not fresh at all. And sorry, I just missed that. If um, sorry, my radio has been down. What's that update? Yeah, it's in Kansas City. Copy, is it the uh, single Wanun? Two Ah, there we go. So different cheetah found to the east of us. Thank you. Um, two male cheetah. So, sorry, I'll be with you in a second. Not, there, not yet, last track's going southeast in the block um, between quarantine and twin dams. Uh, James is following up on foot. So I spied something with my little eye around the corner. And we have some elephants. Or at least one, no, at least two. Hello, Ellie's. Now, remember, when approaching elephants, it's very important to read their body language before we go closer. And the most important thing is watch their tail. Once the tail becomes erected, it means they are upset. That tail is nice and flat. And always pop the car into low range. So your ribs are much lower and you can move slowly and steadily without causing them any undue stress. If they give you the sign that they're not comfortable with your presence, and don't approach and leave immediately. I only see two, but I think they're part of a larger herd. There we go. That little one. Not sure which little breeding herd this is. We'll have a closer look. We have a little female next to us here, munching on a grivia or a raisin bush. Definitely look to be a 
little bit more sprightly than they were yesterday, enjoying this cool weather. So we're going to stay here, see if there's a bigger herd around. But while we're watching this elephant from the vehicle, uh, let's go have a look at an elephant on foot. Okay, everybody, we've just come across a must bull elephant. He was the one that was there, 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 there. There he is. He was, he was the one drinking at the Juma Dam can, pan, I think. He is in full must. So we're not going to approach him any more closely than we have here. We kind of stumbled upon him and he swung around and shook his head at us because, well, we just weren't aware enough of where he was. And then we backed off a bit, checked the wind, and the wind is fine. But we're not going to approach him any more closely than we are now. We're probably about 50 meters from him, 150 feet or so. You can just see those magnificent tusks moving through the bush there. Hmm. Hello, Mike Tyson. You want to know what we do? Okay, he's now looking for our scent, so we're actually going to back off a bit. Come, Brian. Come over here. We're going to just move away. So, Mike Tyson, your question is a good one at this particular stage. You want to know what we do if he try to attack us. Well, before it gets to that stage, of course, before there's any kind of engagement, we're going to move away. So the wind is blowing from the right to left of your screen. And what that means is that he's, he can't smell us, but he will be trying to get our scent. So he's walking around the wind. And there are other elephants just through there. There's a whole herd going through there. And as we suspect, he's in must. And so he will be trying to find that herd of elephants and see if there's an estrus female. It's too thick in here to be trying to get a better view of him at this stage. So I think we're just going to keep slowly walking through here, making sure that we stay upwind of him. So we'll just, we'll just quickly try and get another, well, we'll see if we can get a view here, through here. And it's interesting, you know, I think that elephants have got as eyesight probably as good as ours. But he still definitely, he turned round and he walked into the wind to try and sort of get around and smell of us, even though he could see us, which I think is very interesting. All right, well, while we're walking through here, I think, I'm not sure if we're going to get another view. Let's go back to Brent and uh, catch up with him. We'll see what's going on here and we'll keep you posted. So unfortunately those alleys moved into some quite thick bush, but I've got an interesting little thing to show you guys here, uh, if you're wondering how to age elephants. So this doesn't really work for bulls, but for cows and breeding herds just based on the side. So A is an adult female, B is a sub-adult, like the one we were looking at shortly, probably around 15 years old, C an intermediate, about 6 years old. D, about two years old, and E, an infant, uh, about a year old. So elephants, when they're about a year old, are still able to f fit under the mum's belly, but after they get to a year, they are unable to. There's a nice little diagram uh, to show you see, how to age elephants, more or less. Uh, of, course, of course, it's not an exact science without climbing into the elephant's mouth and observing its teeth. But Jitlo on YouTube is telling me now, we've been chatting about national animals, birds, flowers, etc. that Scotland's national animal the unicorn and it apparently is not a joke uh, so wow you learn something new every day I know Scotland's national flower is the thistle and I suppose if you've got such a thorny 
national flower, and you've got to hope for a unicorn, I suppose. And so what is Ireland? Ireland's national animal, I'm not sure. I, I know their national plant would be the four-leaf clover. So now, Vildi, uh, Vildi would like to know whether Ireland's national animal is the leprechaun. Now, Ireland's quite a fascinating thing. There's not that much indigenous wildlife. Um, there are no snakes. And there's the story that Saint someone chased all the snakes out of Ireland. But I, I think it's because it's an island and they never never got there. So uh, carrying on on the national and uh, flowers and provincial flowers and that. Uh, Eggy saying there, flower is a white trillium, which is also protected, but very nice to see in early spring. Uh, well, where we are now in Pumalanga's national flower, oh, oh, sorry, provincial flower is a thing called a Barberton daisy, which only grows around Barberton, which is a town to the south and east of us. Uh, my home province, which is the best province, VM might disagree with me, is KwaZulu Natal. And our flower is Australitsia, a wild banana. It's a Tsotsi province. It's a Tsotsi province. VM says KwaZulu Natal is a Tsotsi province. For those of you not sure what a Tsotsi is, Tsotsi is um, a Zulu word for a gangster, pretty much. And I think the only Tsotsi around is VM. Ah, oh, hello, little hinged tortoise. Here we go, we have a Speaks hinge tortoise. And it looks like it's got a very strange indentation. I think, oh dear, I think he's narrowly escaped mauling by a hyena or a ground hornbill. And you can see dragging the back left foot and his carapace has managed to save him. As you can see, he's gonna move. I was gonna go have a closer look, but shame. I'm sure he's had quite a rough night. That looks like a very fresh injury. And there's quite a few different animals that might have been able to do that. The two most common culprits are actually probably a lion and a hyena. But they don't normally stop. I think he's escaped from a bird like a ground hornbill that's tried to break open his shell with its powerful beak. But Shane, we're not gonna stay too long. He's obviously had a rough night. And it's quite likely we might see a few more tortoise moving around in this cool weather. Uh, after that, even that slight little bit of drizzle we've been having and had earlier, there'll be lovely moisture on the grass that they'll be able to drink, so they'll be out feeding in force, trying to build up enough reserves uh, for the cold winter months. about what countries cheetah occur in outside of Africa. And Struan, Jared and Arsi say India, which would have been correct up until about, I think it's 100, 100 years ago or so, but they are now currently extinct in India. Well done to Safari Dean and Donna. So, there's a very amazing population of cheetah in Iran. And in the desert there, they've managed to somehow survive all this time. And the thing about cheetah, with them being semi-nomadic, they do pop up in strange places. So it is possible all the countries surrounding Iran 
uh, might randomly get a cheetah, a dispersal cheetah at some point. But at the moment, they are only in Iran, outside of Africa. to Marianne in Boston who's taken into the next level. I also asked where was the largest meta population of cheetah, the one that holds the most genetic diversity and potential for the species. And often people will assume it's the Maasai Mara or the Serengeti or Namibia or Botswana, but it is actually the Greater Kruger National Park. The area we're in at the moment holds the largest number of cheetah in Africa. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, if you have a look, Marianne has, I think, tweeted some of that information. Um, the only population outside, no, so she emailed it. Um, but I'll just get Nikki to read it through to me again. So Kruger, the greater Kruger, or the, the South Africa, has got about 4,000 and some change. Yeah, 4,190. And then And then the rest of the population, and that's Botswana, Namibia, Mozambique, Zambia, etc., is about 3,090. The Serengeti and Masai Mara are actually relatively small, about 400, 460 odd. And then Iran, between 60 and 100. Yeah, 446, yeah. So very interesting. Uh, everyone immediately assumes the wide, wide open plains with Serengeti and Masai Mara will hold the most cheetah. But for, throughout most of their range, cheetah live in a mixed woodland like we're driving through right now. And here comes, I oh, apologize for the spots that are going to appear on the lens shortly. You can feel a bit more. Cheetah spots. Ah, oh, see, VM is now, now goading me, mocking me. He says, you mean the cheetah spots? I, I'm hoping, VM, I'm hoping. We, will a leopard be okay, though? No. Uh, VM, VM doesn't even want to see a leopard. He only wants cheetah this morning. So we're going to try and produce that for you. While we do that, let's jump on foot with James. So we moved away from that elephant who was trying to get upwind of us and smell us. It was quite amazing to see. We did smell him. We moved further up the wind from him, and he smelt well. Nothing that smells quite like green penis syndrome, which is, of course, what elephants get when they are in must. I am continually whispering because there are more elephants over here, and we're going to climb up onto this ridge and just get see if we can get a view of another elephant coming through this drainage system. Thick bush, so it's nice for the elephants. There's stuff for them to eat in here. But again, we're not going to go blundering through here trying to get a view. If there isn't an obvious one from here, I can hear him here. In fact, you can just see the bushes. You can just see the bushes shaking there. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. Oh, there's another one right here. Hello, Juliet in Wyoming. You want to know if animals are put off by the scent of soap and powder and Brian's delightful aftershave. Juliet, I'm not sure that they're put off by it. They're put off by human scent, absolutely. They don't like our smell. Um, I think it's more a scent of our pheromones. I don't think it's the soap. I don't think it's the kind of aftershave and our cosmetics. Although those will obviously be very unfamiliar to them. But certainly they pick up our human scent through amazing other scents. So if you park a Land Rover 
which smells basically of petrol, especially if you're driving jigger. It smells of oil and petrol and brake fluid and grease and grime. But if the wind changes and you're viewing elephants and the wind suddenly blows from behind you, they will pick up your human scent through all the stink of that mechanical engine and the exhaust smoke and all of that, and they will react to that immediately. So I don't think that our soap and cosmetics make a big difference. I'm just listening to another herd of elephants calling in the distance, a youngster going, Wah! Otherwise, it's all peace. But everywhere we turn, there is an elephant. And it's so funny, some days you have days like that where you cannot move 20 or 30 meters without seeing an elephant. We're not going to approach that elephant any closer. What we're going to do is head up the drainage line. The tracks of the lions did cross down in here. And I think the rest of that herd, and possibly that must bull, is coming this way too. So we're going to just head further north up the drainage line towards the Juma Dam and see if we don't pick up further tracks of the lions. Now, Donna, you're in Rhode Island. And while we extract ourselves from this situation, you want to know about bees and whether or not we've seen them on Bushwalk. Yes, I've seen plenty of bees on Bushwalk, Donna. Uh, we have never seen, I've actually seen a swarm of bees on Bushwalk. I've never been set upon by a swarm of bees though. And I think there is a bit of a um, misconception around the world that um, African bees are particularly dangerous. And I think it comes from the conception of African killer bees, which are a hybridized bee, as far as I remember, that was introduced to the United States or Europe. I think and they weren't particularly friendly bees. But no, I've never been set upon by bees here. Brian, you've been set upon by bees? One sting here and there. One sting here and there, says Brian. We're also listening carefully. I can hear octopus calling all over us. There were some mother through here. This below country walking with the great care and slowness, but it's just one to walk in some green, relatively different landscape compared with what we're normally in. Sorry about the signal, everyone. We are quite low down, and we might have to go across to Brent, but we'll keep you posted. The idea now is that we try and find those lion tracks. <laughs> Tammy, you want to see a golden orb web spider. Tammy, I'd love to find you one, but I've seen one this year. And I don't think that little spattering of rain that we had last night is going to do anything um, to encourage the golden orb web spiders, I'm afraid. So I certainly stop if we find one, but if we don't, I apologize in advance. <laughs> Let's just stop and answer this question. We have four-year-old Ella in Minneapolis. Ella, you're still awake. Uh, you want to know if we get rabbits in Africa. Ella, we do get rabbits in Africa, but not around here. We get something similar called a hare, and your mum or dad can tell you the difference between a rabbit and a hare, but we don't get rabbits. We get rabbits in the Cape, but hares look very similar to rabbits, but they're not active during the daytime, of course. They're active at night, and that's when we might be lucky enough to see what we call a scrub hare. Thank you, Ella. What a lovely little question. Heather, you're in, you're in Canada, and Brent was talking to you about national flowers and that sort of thing, and you want to know if we would um, see more flowers in the absence of the drought, definitely. Now, this would be a swathe of, well, I mean, look, it wouldn't be a swathe of colour. It wouldn't look like the, uh, the tulip gardens of Paris, for example, but it would certainly be uh, dotted with bits of morning glories and probably the odd gardenia and lots of other kinds of small flowers, small subtle flowers, 
but at the moment, no. The drought has put pay to that. You don't ever get the national flower here, which I'm sure Brent told you, the king protea does not occur in this area. Beautiful flower that it is. Nor does the chaliun, actually, the uh, national fish. I haven't seen many of them around these parts. Have you seen one, Brian? Mm. <laughs> Just listening here. Now, Siberia Zumi, you are wondering whether elephants will communicate our presence to each other. So if we were walking along and we saw an elephant, bull, wooded or a cow, would they rumble and alert the others to our presence? Siberia, I think that's a way of saying, there are people over there, watch out. I don't know. I wouldn't say it's beyond the realms of possibility. But absolutely, they will have a, a rumble alarm of that makes them all look up and look in a particular direction. Good question. So the lion tracks down through here. I haven't seen them again. And of course, if you look at the ground here, it's not... I mean, if you've got a soft pad, for example, I weigh... What do I weigh, Brian? I weigh about 70 kilograms, about 160 pounds. And a lioness is about 120 kilograms, almost double my mass. But I'm not leaving any sign as I walk, no obvious sign. And a lioness has little soft pads. I don't think it's going to, she will leave a sign. And to a highly experienced tracker, they may be able to spot some tracks here. But it's going to be very difficult on the top of the crust of the rain to find any tracks. Look at this little pan here. So this would be an ideal spot for elephants to come and throw mud in themselves, to come and lie when there's a bit of rain around. But in a drought like this, of course, there's no water here at all. Let's just try and pick out some of this clay. I might wedge it out. Right, we're back. Sorry about that, everybody. Froze there, Brian. You didn't freeze, did you? No, no. Uh, retrieve. Think about clay, of course. I think. I mean, this may bore the tears out of you, but I think it's quite interesting. Clay like this, you can see it's cracked up here. Clay is full of minerals, and a lot of those minerals and and elemental various kinds of um, compounds are ionic, which means that they have a, they hold a charge in the same way that, well, well, like an iron holds charge. It's difficult to say, to, to make it more simple than that. But what that means is that when they are wet, all of those minerals go into solution, which means they mix in the water in the same way that if you mix salt in water, you get a splitting up of the sodium and chlorine that make up the salt, and you get sodium ions and chlorine ions, or chloride ions. And if I'm not mistaken, same thing happens in, in, a, in clay like this. And when the water comes in, that all goes into solution. And then when the water disappears again, those ions are reattracted towards each other. And what that does is to create this contraction of the clay. And when they go out of, so when then it rains again, they, can, they go into solution and they start to repel each other out in the same way that two magnets might repel each other. And that's why the clay, you get these example of why you get these cracked clay areas. So for those of you who are chemically minded, that's why that happens. For those who are not, wake up again and we'll continue going along here and see if we can find some lion tracks. Uh, right, okay, let's quickly, <laughs> a wonderful comment from Insomniac here, 
who says <laughs> Ella's mother or father, aged four, were probably panicking because they might not know the difference between a rabbit and a hare. Ella, you're four, of course. The difference, the main difference is, of course, is that a rabbit, very small front legs, and you can see what you would call a bunny, and they like to hop. A hare can run, they don't hop like rabbits do. Rabbits live in holes and hares live outside on the top of the ground. Main basic differences. Let's head across to Brent, see what he's doing, and I'm going to continue up onto the road over here. Hello, uh, we are searching <laughs> and searching. Unfortunately, we haven't even found uh, the glimmer of a track. So, James had the last line tracks in this block off there, so I'm just going to do a wider loop around the same block. Maybe they changed direction slightly and came towards a tree house. Kyle, my sitters would like to know, would a bird alarm at a cheetah? Most definitely. Uh, they would alarm it the same way they alarm at a lion or a leopard. Not that we've heard many bird alarm calls today. It's a baby diker, maybe it won't run. It's a really tiny little diker. Just a few months old. Hello, little one. And look at those very dope. Oh, look at that little jump. I, know, I don't know if you guys managed to see him sniffing towards us, but just underneath its eyes, you've got very distinct preorbital glands, although its head is obviously firmly behind the knob thorn. There we go, you can actually see that little slit if it turns his head again. The preorbital gland used for scent marking. Oh, it's a tiny little guy. Very, very cute. Now, we are starting to get much better diker sightings, and it's due to the drought. We're getting, being able to see further, and they don't have as much cover to hide in. Hey, little one. Now, very interesting, diker is one of the only antelopes that has been recorded hunting ground birds and eating ground nesting birds like Franklin. There have been a few cases of this diker, the grey diker, doing it. Now, your forest dikers up in Central Africa do it with some regularity. Definitely one of the best sightings we've had of a little diker. So, a little baby diker is one of the smallest animals we're ever going to see out here. And James has managed to find something even smaller. Now, small this is, but it is the largest, apparently, ant that we get here, well, one of the largest, and it has a rather interesting name. I'm reliably informed by the Stefan Winterboer, and so should you be offended by his name, um, please take it up with him. This is called a ball-biting ant. So named, I assume, because of the effect it has on the male anatomy while sitting having a picnic, precisely as I am doing now. I am being very careful what crawls up the inside of my shorts, because if you look at the mandibles on this fellow, they are quite vicious, and you would not want them clamping onto any of your nether regions, indeed any of your regions. Isn't he amazing? I've, I've been trying for ages to try and get him to sit on a stick. He didn't like the stick that Brent gave me, but he likes this stick. Half tempted to let him crawl onto my hand and see how painful he could possibly be but my heart rate is going up now. I'm getting very nervous indeed as he moves towards my flesh. 
I don't think he likes the smell of me. Thankfully, he decided he didn't like the smell of me, and he's now moving back down the stick. He's deeply confused as to how he's become a flying ant suddenly. And you can see his feelers bobbing about the place, trying to figure out what on earth's going on. Those will be picking up pheromones every so often. He'll keep cleaning them, and tasting them, and seeing what's on the end of them. But he'll be picking up subtle vibrations that we don't even understand with those very sensitive feelers that he has there. And it was quite interesting that Nicky is just saying that he looks like the cr a cross between a wasp and an ant. And interestingly, they belong to the same order. They both belong to the order Hymenoptera. So it's not unusual that you would find that they look similar in some ways. Now, an order is a very broad um, taxa or taxon, which means, I mean, there are millions of species of different things that fit into the order Hymenoptera. There are ants, bees, wasps, but that's why he looks quite similar. Ooh, I'm getting very nervous now. Oh, there he goes, onto the ground. Right. That is the ball-biting ant, everyone. Let's link back across to Brent while I um, live and uh, allow my heart rate to return to normal as everything is intact as it should be. Back to Brent. So guys, we're following a spotted hyena. We can see if it pops out into this gap here. Here we go. I think it's just on patrol, seeing what it might be about. They cover vast, vast distances. It's time for this thing to fall again. I've lost sight of it. VM, do you still have sight? Mm -hmm. Where are you? Oh, there it is. Changing direction, heading off into the drainage. But no excitement, which would lead me to believe it was on the trail of the lion or the leopard. And these lions have done a very mysterious disappearing act. So it's still no tracks anywhere. Okay. And unfortunately, the leopard that's out and about, uh, Scott said he heard her catch a diker in an inaccessible area. We might go have a little check around, see if maybe lying up outside of the inaccessible area a bit later. But I'm quite astounded that we haven't seen any nice fresh lion tracks this morning. Because they definitely haven't left Juma, so they're still here somewhere. Leopards. Derek's wondering what's the latest update on Shadow. Has anyone seen her? Uh, does she have cubs? As far as I'm aware, I don't know if she's got cubs yet. Uh, I have seen her tracks a few times. I know Scott's also had her tracks up around the area of Sydney's dam and one eye pan. Uh, but I think the last person to see her was Jamie. And from my understanding, it didn't look like she was suckling just yet but it did look like she was quite heavy in the belly so it is possible and shadow when she has cubs becomes incredibly sneaky and she's sneaky at the best of times but she moves into an area uh, she traditionally has her cubs in an area where it's, it's impossible to get a vehicle and uh, so everyone and no one has actually had a really good sighting of her in a few few days even from the other guides okay Vim? We've checked where the lights are. Yeah. But we've been, we've been there. We didn't check on up. I think they're over there. I think they're between the Mawati River System and Buffalo Hook Dam. Um, and that's just purely from the process of elimination. We haven't had tracks anywhere else, and it's the only place we haven't been this morning.
So, good morning, uh, Dr. Mac. Uh, Dr. Mac is wondering if a copy or bongo are possible to find here. Dr. Mac, I wish. Uh, no, uh, bongo and a copy are rainforest species. Uh, a copy is a very specialized rainforest species. It's the only relative to the giraffe. And it lives between the River Cross and the River Congo, right in the center of the Congo Basin in one of the most impenetrable part of forests in the world. There's no easy access to get to where the Akami live. It lives in the same area as the Bonobo and the Congo Peacock, also very difficult animals to see in the wild. Uh, Bongo is a lot more wi widely spread from the Abadez uh, mountain range in Kenya all the way through to the west, but again, still very much a forest species. And this is the largest of the sort of true Trafalagans or Trafalagus species. Uh, and Eland is also a Trafalagan, but it's a Taurotragus, not a Trafalagus. And And bongo, unfortunately, do not occur anywhere near us. The closest bongo to us is probably living in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Maybe more than Angola. Hello, pigs. unusual to see. Yeah, there's big tusks on the front guy. It's unusual to see two male warthog together, both adults. And normally well, they're in direct competition for breeding. But the rat hasn't really started, so maybe that's why they're playing the safety and numbers game. And we were chatting a few safaris ago about the warthogs, male warthog have two very different sort of breeding strategies. The one is the rover who moves from area to area chasing ladies. And the other is the stayer who will defend a certain area, uh, either a certain group of females or multiple groups of females or a water source or food resource. And judging from these two, they must be rovers. Decided to make a temporary alliance Try and make sure they don't get eaten by lions. You see those massive tusks. Very, very impressive set of tusks on that boy. Yes, and the oxpeckers have found them as well. Now I'm going to show you a picture here quickly. of a warthog skull and those big massive tusks on top are actually not the ones that they do a lot of damage with. These bottom tusks are called tushes rub up against the, the top tusk and become sharpened and they're literally as, as sharp as a razor blade and those are actually what they use mainly to defend themselves. You can see those are modified canines. So we'll let the, the bachelor boys carry on moving through into the bush, and I'm hoping to see at least one lion track on the sunrise safari. Virginia Beach. Eric would like to know the classification of this bio. Eric heard me mention mixed woodland earlier, and he'd like to know, is it savanna, is it temperate grassland, or is it a sub biome called mixed woodland? Uh, it is a part of the savanna, bi savanna biome, and the, the savanna biomes are a very wide and diverse biome, but uh, it is a savanna biome dominated by mixed broad-leaved woodland, if we want to be specific, and 
the broadleafed woodland is mostly made up of different combretum or bush willow species interspersed with the odd acacia, marula, and of course quite a few other things. But those are probably the three most dominant uh, families that are represented in this type of savanna. Now, uh, there's lots of different types of savanna. Not too far away from us, we have Now, uh, when you see small breeding herds of buffalo or female buffaloes in little groups like this, it means they have generally had a tough night and they've been harassed by Africa's largest cat during the evening. I'm looking a little bit nervous, but the lions are not here unless they are sneaking up on them and we can't see them yet. It doesn't look like it. They are a little bit nervous, but not too nervous. I'm trying to think now. Should we change our route for him? Remember what happened last time when we had the... Uh, yes, the that is correct. We will keep going straight then. We will not change our route. Vim, why didn't you tell us what happened last time? Uh, watched the buffalo for half an hour. Yes. And then we left, and then the lines picked up. It was very sad. Javier and I were sitting on cheetah cut line with a small little herd all corralled together. And we spent, we heard lions and we thought the lions were in that area. And we spent yeah, half an hour, 45 minutes sitting next to a sleeping buffalo. And we're like, okay, let's move on. And we carried on, carried on. And uh, yeah, about 45 minutes, an hour later, Ephraim comes on the radio and says, oh, I've just found the lions. They've just killed a baby buffalo. And it was from the exact herd we'd been sitting with. So I think, I, I'm not sure if Vim wants me to stay and watch those buffalo for the rest of uh, the drive. But uh, hopefully we, we do get a little bit of luck. I haven't seen any tracks yet. But let's see how Master Henry is going on Shanks Pope. We are not in a good area here. We have come across where the lions were yesterday and they have relieved themselves liberally all around this area. It smells like the bowels of Satan himself. This is exactly where the lion pride was last night and what is interesting so we've done kind of a big loop I don't want to show you any more of that it's absolutely foul um, basically quarantine clearings up off to the right hand side there or to your left hand side my right and they went onto the clearings during the night turned around came back down and the road where the Wahlberg's nest is is just over there and this is where they were lying earlier in the day so the one knocked about here for a substantial period yesterday evening and then they walked back away. Now we didn't come here to see they were here because we knew they wouldn't be here. What we came along here for was we found some leopard tracks coming out here, probably from Karula yesterday when she was walking about here. So we just thought we'd follow them up towards the camp. Uh, we're nowhere near where she could have a den site if she still has a den site. So we just thought we'd follow the tracks and see what we could find. Haven't come up with anything at this stage though, but the stink of these lion um, dungs, as it were, is just quite unspeakable. Right. Ooh, that one definitely had a problem. Don't you think? Mm. Yeah. Definitely had a bit of an issue. Probably has maybe caught it from Andrew. He, of course, had that problem the other day. Probably. Could have caught it from Andrew. Right. On we go. <laughs> Sorry about that, I just couldn't resist it. <laughs> hmm. Sorry. Now, Genevieve, you're in New York and you want to know about whether animals have developed resistance to parasites, wasps and flies. The history of evolution apparently is far more a story of disease and parasite resistance, the kind of red queen race between parasites and their hosts than it is a 
the story that we all know of you know kind of a gentle progression or change over time in order to adapt to an environment a major part of any environment is the existence of parasites in an area now we were talking about ticks and we were talking about ants. Ants, of course, are very seldom parasitic. In fact, if ever, I don't think. But certainly ticks are parasites. And they deliver disease. They, in turn, deliver parasitoids into other animals. And those animals would have developed the resistance or the ability to try and resist the parasites that they, you know, are inject. In terms of wasps and things like that, um, so, I mean, parasitic wasp, I guess, could be considered something like a spider hunting wasp or a caterpillar hunting wasp, or mud wasp, which will catch something, paralyze it, lay its eggs within the body of that animal, and then uh, put them in a, a mud cocoon or something like that, or in a hole in the case of a parasitic spider hunting wasp. Now, what's interesting about that as we walk along here, just looking for tracks and listening to the ox peckers, getting quite close to the Juma Dam pan, where there may or may not be some beefaloes about. Um, the interesting thing about that is that it is an evolutionary arms race. So at the moment, the race is being completely dominated in the terms of the spider hunting wasp by the wasps. But because they're not having enough of an effect on the population to make spiders disappear, there's obviously some kind of balance, which means the spiders, despite the fact that we can't see what's going on, definitely will have some form of resistance, either, even if it's something as simple as being difficult to find for the spiders. As soon as the balance shifts, and as soon as perhaps the wasps become totally dominant over the spiders, well then of course the wasp numbers must drop, and they have to invent another strategy or die out as a species entirely. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple thing to talk about, especially not when we're um, on the bushwalk. But that's the basic idea, Genevieve. I hope that kind of answers your question. Now, Catherine, you're in Texas, and you reckon that you've read that ants can help to control a tick population. I don't know of any particularly tick-hungry ants. I know that ants are often voracious predators. We're going to go up onto the dam wall and then we can look down the drainage and just see if we can't spot something there. I don't know if they're particularly voracious predators of ticks out here. I don't think that they are. I don't know of any, but there are hundreds of species of ants out here. Some of them may well specialize in eating ticks. I'm not sure what their effects on our tick population would be though, but that's an interesting question. Thank you. <laughs> so apparently the hippopotamus is in the Juma Dam pan. So we won't be approaching him very closely, but we might be able to get a small view of him from up here. Ah. Now, Papas, you have been trying to think about coming on an African safari for a long time. You can see the mystic boer behind me. It's not so mystic at the moment. And um, <laughs> Papas, you've been discouraged from coming on an African safari because you've heard that they're not very personal, that it's all just become a great, great big tourist trap, that you drive along in a line to view animals, and that it's not actually a very wilderness experience. Papas, there are places you can go that are exactly like that. They are few and far between, mercifully. There are hundreds, literally, of lodges around here, around the Timbavati, the Manyaleti, north of us, um, into East Africa, Botswana, Mozambique, Namibia, where you will have a pristine, private, beautiful experience out here, where you will not see another vehicle, where you will not see another person. You can go on a walking safari, just like we're doing now, and have this intimate wilderness experience that we're enjoying. Please don't be discouraged by the thought that everywhere you go is going to be filled with zebra-striped 
minibuses uh, where you'll have to share a sighting with 50 other cars. There are lots and lots and lots of places where that is not the case. So puppers, if you come out here, you might also be lucky enough to see a blue wax bull. Can you see them there, Brian? They're just knocking about on the floor underneath that tree there. We so seldom see them nicely on camera. And we often get requests for them, but we so seldom see them nicely on camera. Yeah, he's just moving there. Can you see him there? They're very difficult. Yeah, there are some in the bush there. You can hear them going. They're very common to abundant residents, there is how they're described. But common to abundant, of course, is one thing. Being able to film them is entirely another. Now, I was rather hoping I might see the dica that Karula killed yesterday, draped from a tree, with her sitting at a safe distance in the tree from us, but that has not been the case. So Brian reckons that she probably would have just eaten and moved on. And I think that's probably quite a good postulation. Also saw lots of hyena tracks going through the drainage line, so I don't think there, that if she left it on the ground, there certainly wouldn't be anything left. Anyway, have a look down here. Mm. If we come over here, Brian, you might be able to get the blue wax bulls here. Now, Martin Machik, you are asking a query that is often forefront of many minds. If you just look around here, you might get them, Brian. I know they're flying all over the place. While Brian is trying his level best to get a picture of these very darty finches, there's one on the ground. Um, Martin, you want to know about snakes and what is the most dangerous snake we get here, A, and B, uh, do we get, how many do we get? Martin, we get lots of species of snakes. I'd say probably around 25 to 30 species of snake in this area, if you were to count everything that was possibly seen. In terms of the most dangerous, well, again, I know I say this, I bang on about it a lot, but until I stop hearing people refer to animals as dangerous, I will keep doing it. No snake is inherently dangerous. Lots of snakes can be potentially dangerous. Okay, no snake will, and the reason I say that is because by saying something is dangerous, the immediate inference is that they will try and actually actively seek out to bite you and do you harm. They will not. All snakes here will move away if they can. Given half the chance, no snake will choose to engage with a human being they will normally move away. That said, if you threaten a snake, and especially for perhaps a black mamba, which is extremely ven venomous, if you corner a black mamba, you well, then you're likely to get bitten three or four times and be dead within half an hour. But the chances of actually cornering a black mamba are very small, and most of the people who've ever been killed by black mambas have either been trying to beat them to death with a broomstick or snake themselves. So please don't come out here, or don't think that you can't come out here because there are a terrifying plethora of dangerous snakes looking to try and bite you. There's another bird in there. Oh, Brian, it's a, it's a grey-headed sparrow. Very exciting. I'm very pleased that Brian's managed to show you the blue wax bull. Now, we're sitting on the damn wall here, and I heard the approach of some elephants they were making some noise, and I wonder if they won't come and have a drink at the Jumadam pan. This, of course, would be the ideal position to be viewing them from. But what we might do is go across to the other side and see what we can see from there. Wonderful, wonderful settling of the morning, from the expectation of the dawn to what we have now, where there's just a feeling of the wor world breathing out. There we can see the nice wax ball. Well done, Brian. Brian, of course, is now squatting, which means the pain in his thighs will be reaching fever point at the moment. How's it, how's it feeling there, Brian? Pretty good. Pretty good. good the, the deep burn. Very nice. Well done. So if you see the camera start shaking, that's why. It's not because Brian is um, 
you know, in need of his morning coffee or anything like that. It's because lactic acid is building. Oh, look, 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 look. There's some, yeah, yeah. see? Did you get them, right? <laughs> they're, on the, they're on the bush behind there. A yellow fronted canary, everybody. We had our first really good sighting of one yesterday from the vehicle with Brian. Well done, Brian. Brian's the yellow fronted canary champion, of course. Now they will often feed in mixed groups with wax bulls. You can see the same kind of beak. They're seed eaters, just like all of the other finches. You, this is Robin calling here. There's a woodpecker tapping. There's some elephants rumbling in the distance. There's a still gentle smell of petrichor coming off the earth after the rain. That's very pleasant sitting here for me. For Brian, it's deeply unpleasant because of course he's crouched in a particularly uncomfortable position. Right, okay, Brian, you can stand up now if you want. <laughs> Maybe you can't. <laughs> Brian might be stuck, everybody. Oh! There we go, he's okay. Okay, so you are now looking at the damn camera. You're watching us on the damn wall there. You can see the Mystic Boer investigating various different kinds of tracks down in the bottom of the dam there. Wave, Steph, you're on, you're on the Juma Dam cam at the moment. Ooh. And this is, of course, half the reason we bring Steph on the drives. He's found a mantis of some sort. Ooh, this is fas fascinating. Brian, um, are you going to make it down here? Those great tractor tire boots of yours. Oh no. Biggest leaf on the left hand side. Oh, that there. is amazing. I think maybe this side, Brian. This is an incredible spot. Oh wow. Now, we were talking about, before we get in close, we were talking about an evolutionary arms race going on here. This mantis that we're going to show you, if you look at the flowers on this plant, you can see that this mantis, which is a predator, has evolved to be disguised almost exactly as one of the buds on this plant, which means it's probably entirely host specific. Look at this absolutely magnificent mantis. And while we do that, Jen B, thank you very much for complimenting Brian's, yes, very great. Oh my goodness, sorry you lost us briefly there. Look at that thing. Isn't that incredible? Perfectly camouflaged and it would normally sit, I imagine, just next to the bud of the flower and then when some insect came along to try and pollinate the flower, attracted by the beautiful yellow colours of these subtle yellow flowers, so the mantis will then leap upon it and devour it. Alright, what we're going to do everybody is reboot the camera. While we're doing that, just because you, the picture is breaking up a bit, while we do that you'll be looking at probably the damn camera. Stand by. is a pioneer, do you know what it is? Uh, an, oh, yes. Okay, here we go. So, sorry about the damn camera moved off us for a second. The zoomie obviously got sick and tired of us. That's okay. I get sick and tired of us sometimes myself. Anyway, there is the magnificent mantis here. The picture, I think, is a bit better. Now, what you need to notice is that his colours are an exact kind of representation of those buds. So while he doesn't look like a flower, he does look like the buds from which the flowers come. 
and Steph said before I kicked a stone onto this plant, um, there was a wasp sitting here, also probably waiting to prey on something. But there was also a mapani fly, or mapani bee, which is a very small bee that comes and will take out the nectar from a little flower like this. And the plant species is called Waltheria. And I suspect quite strongly that this mantis will be unable to survive in the absence of the Waltheria plant, because I think, I might be wrong, there might be a few species they can live on. I think that he is per perfectly evolved to look precisely like this particular flower. You can imagine him on another plant perhaps not looking nearly as obvious. And look, his eyes are watching my finger now and watch how his feelers come up. Isn't that unbelievable? And now he might, I might induce him to attack me. Box. Box. No. It's probably a she as well. Might be a she or a he. Mantises, of course, devour their husbands. She looks like a bit of a Jezebel to me. And of course, like I say, it's not easy for him to maintain these positions because he's, there's the wasp. No, don't worry about the wasp, Brian. The wasp is going to be a new level even from the red, yellow fronted canary, I mean. Isn't that amazing? I mean, yeah, what else can you say? So a mantis, of course, is a predator, like I say. They will be waiting for the mapani bees to come along. It'll grab them with those spiked front legs there, stick them in her mouth, devour them, and then sit beautifully huddled along here. And just before we go across to Brent, what I want to show you is some, just some silky buildup there on the surface of the leaf there, Brian. And I wonder isn't, if that isn't the beginnings of an uthica or an egg sac that a mantis like this might make. Okay, let's go across to Brent, see what he's got to tell you about. We'll move around this general area and catch up with you just now. So, I am, I am, Confused, absolutely and completely at lack of ideas almost. I cannot find a track. I have driven around and around and around and I do not know where the big cats are gone. I really hate to admit that. But from what Scotty told me, Queen Karula sounded like she caught a die cat yesterday in this drainage line. So we're just gonna go up and maybe we might find a different access point in there um, from where it's got to. But if she is in the headwaters of this river system, it is gonna be impossible to get into. Round. We were looking at the um, mantis and the mystic boer just pointed behind us and there the buffalo were coming across the dry expanse of this dam and I suspect what they were doing was just grazing in amongst the sort of, I don't want to say grassland because there aren't any, but sort of woodlands off to the north of the camp where there is still a bit of grazing. Now they'll come back for their normal daily ritual have a drink of the befouled water, then they'll probably lie in it and chew their cud. They're very rhythmical in their uh, methods, are the buffalo, 
They like to do things, well, you know, they're like old people, if you like. They have a certain way of doing things during the day, and these buffalo, I don't think, are any different. They are hiding behind. They're jumping into the pond with Peter. And I'm just going to look carefully, scanning the bushes for the leopardine face of Karula, because she does like to hide around here. Keep an eye on things. There's another buffalo coming, Brian. So we'll quickly pop across to that buffalo. And while we're doing that, let's go back to Brent, find out what he's doing. I think we'll sit here for a few minutes longer. What we're doing is we're checking every tree uh, that we can actually see from this area. See if possibly the queen hasn't dragged her carcass into a more accessible spot for us. Getting towards the end of where we're going to be able to traverse this river system. It's a really beautiful little system. Wonderful big trees, tiburtis, acacias, leadwoods, jackal berries. circumstances hyenas do a lot of their own hunting and they're very good at it um, in quite a few areas they actually have a better success rate than lion or leopard then we're going to get stuck I sort of knew we were going to have this issue there was incorrect, we need to go further straight. We just don't want to have all four tires off the ground. Nope, that was a, a leopard that like termite mound. There we go. Got the angle right for that time. specific species of tree climbing dicer at the moment. And I think alas this is where it ends for us. Maybe I'll come have a look on bushwalk this afternoon. We can walk through here. That's the awesome thing about bushwalk able to get places that the car can't. Now for the 200 point turn. Let's see a better option. There we go. Penny Pine is wondering whether I have arthritis in my wrists. And is that why I wear the copper bracelets? Uh, 
No, I, hopefully I shouldn't have arthritis at the ripe old age of 33 years old, um, or 32. Uh, they are reminders of different places I've been and uh, collectors. I've collected them from different spots I've travelled. I've got a few more that I'm just not wearing because it makes a bit too much noise when I'm walking in the bush. They jingle, jangle together. the Sunset Safari and he's starting from the top and walking through. Let's see if there are any easier escape routes than the way we came. I think there is. Voila! Guys, remember, we are live, and the most incredible thing is you are able to ask us questions about anything you're wondering about the bush uh, or about what we're seeing. There's not much at this very moment in time. Hopefully, we will rectify that shortly. But you can send your questions via two formats. You can pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv, or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Some hyena tracks. I think VM, after coming back from Lima, has chased all the big cats away. We were seeing plenty till he arrived. Well, let's go see if we can find some bear like creatures. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely no, not a lion track, not a cheetah track, not a leopard track. All the tracks that we've seen are really old and not worth following. Mm. Maybe they are poor cuddling lions at least in the bottom of a thicket somewhere. Monkey man, sometimes known as a joey in Australia. I said, is it true when a cheetah pops its tail up in the air, sort of waves it about, it's indicating to the other animals that it's not actually hunting? Uh, joey, that is a leopard, not a cheetah, that does that. Uh, a leopard will do that when they are being spotted, when their pile are already snorting, or they will also often do it when they um, are being approached by friend. birds and being mobbed. My sisticular is going shh, 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 shh. Ah, okay. As we are still on the prowl, on the prowl is still prowling for questions and all, not prowling for questions, prowling for answers. Um, on the prowl would like to know, why do baby cheetahs uh, look grey when they are young? Well, on the prowl, it's actually sort of almost silver if you talk about it, uh, if you look at it carefully, and it's so they camouflage in with long grass, easy. they sort of match the dry grass uh, that they might be hiding up in. It's a form of camouflage that is to aid them in surviving and not being spotted by other predators such as lion, leopard, and hyena. 
It's falling off at the end. I'm trying to make sure it stays. The tape solution was not the answer, I think. So we just mentioned hyenas. I think it's time to pop in to the hyena den and see what's happening there. wondering who the oldest or youngest, sorry, member of the Wild Earth crew. So the crew on the ground, I think, in, if we start at the top, from oldest to youngest, will be uh, Stefan uh, Winterboer. Oh no, Eugene, ground crew. Eugene, Steph, then Jemps, then, oh, heaven forbid, me. Uh, after me, Scott, after Scott, how old are you now, Billy? Scott and all the oh, Scott and all the cameramen are all, all the same age, uh, except for Dave. Oh no, Alex. Alex is a oh, year older than me. Oh, we got a quick lick and we'll be back with who's the youngest member of the Wild Earth crew. Now that's the same elephant, everybody, that we were just viewing earlier on in the thick bush. He's w definitely seen us, he's watched us. Uh, but he's a good safe distance away and we're not far from home. We could probably escape from him were he to try and do the same kind of investigation that he did of us the other day. Brian, have you, have you still got a view there? We'll probably get a decent view from the edge here. Oh, he's, he's pulling down some tree. There he is. We can move a little bit closer here. Because now Oh, now of course we've got some space. We've also got some openness, so we can see exactly what he's going to do. Now I can smell him. You smell that? You can smell the must on him. This is a good, good distance to be viewing a must bull elephant from. Now, while we're looking at him, I don't know how many of you were keeping an eye on the Juma Dam cam, but Steph and Brian and I nonchalantly walked across the dam wall sort of thinking the bows buffalo would just stay where they were. But they formed a sort of phalanx. And as Steph says, he said, what, he takes one brave buffalo. And they kind of formed a sort of fighting line and then they came forward towards us. And at some distance, I mean, we were never closer than maybe a hundred meters from them. And they just got it in their minds that we were up to no good. And every time we went behind a bush, which was unavoidable, we tried to stay out in the open so they'd come a little bit forward because of course that's exactly what a predator would do. It would go behind a bush and then sort of try and sneak up again. And so as long as we were in the open, the buffalo just stood dead still and watched us. As soon as we went behind a termite mine or a bush by mistake, they came forward a bit. So it was a very interesting experience. I don't think we were in any danger at any stage. We would have been if we just stayed around there, but we made it very clear that we were leaving and so they didn't seem to worry too much and they've wandered off down twin dams. Now you can see that this elephant is dripping and that like I said earlier is called green penis syndrome and that smell that we can get here which is a kind of let me try and describe it to you I mean it smells a little bit like urine but it is very um, it's very kind of it's like a sweet musty smell hey mm. hey Brian how else would you describe it? it's quite sweet very pungent and you can even see that it's green apparently I can't see on Brian's screen because it's gone through a thorn bush or seven marvelous let's just go around this way a little bit Brian we can probably get another view of his magnificent set of ivory so we're probably standing a good 150 to 200 meters from that elephant maybe yeah, you know, about 150 meters that's about 500 feet and there you can sort of see his ivory there he will be aware of us because we're standing in the open but he doesn't seem to be too keen on trying to get around the wind again as he was earlier of course when we last saw him we were in thick bush 
Now that will make him feel slightly threatened because he won't be able to see exactly where and what we're doing. Now, much like with the buffalo, because we're out in the open, he's not particularly concerned about us. Elephant bulls in must, people will tell you again, are aggressive. And it's a bit like the word dangerous for me. I don't like to use the term aggressive. Of course, some animals can become aggressive. Very few are inherently, aggre inherently aggressive, with perhaps the exception of a must bull. He will tend to look for a fight sometimes, as opposed to try and avoid a fight at all costs, which is what most of the animals do out here. And it's just because there's testosterone coursing through his body right now. <coughs> and testosterone, as we all know, creates aggression. <coughs> Excuse me, a bit of a frog in my throat. You can see his ivory sticking out there behind the tree. Wonderful shot there. I'm glad we got to spend a bit of time with this fellow, I must say. We got a very sh small view of him earlier on. Hmm. You see what he's eating, Brian? Right? Gee was. Hello, Freedom Believer. You're on YouTube and you want to know whether we do anything with the ivory if we find it in the bush. Um, Freedom Believer, normally if an elephant dies, we will call in the authorities. They will take the ivory and it becomes part of a stockpile. So that's what would happen. If we found ivory randomly in the bush, <coughs> um, sometimes we just leave it exactly where it was. Otherwise, you can collect it and hand it over to the owners of the, or the authorities of the land, and they can then collect it, put it, make it part of the stockpile. For me, there's something inherently slightly distasteful about keeping a stockpile of ivory because, of course, I think it's people hedging their bets that one day they might actually be able to sell it off at a great cost. Whereas I think ivory, if it's found, should just simply be burned. What a wonderful view. Brian, let's do just a little sneak around this tree and then we'll head back sort of towards home. While we reposition here, let's go across to Brent, find out what he's doing. I'm just going to try and get one more view here because he is picking branches out of the tree. Watch here, watch here, watch here. He would have heard that. That's a silver cluster leaf taking a horrible beating there. That is very cool. Hmm. Okay, let's go across to Brent, see what he's got to tell you. We'll probably spend the next few minutes right here. So it seems all the predators on Nijuma know something I don't, because there's not a hyena at the hyena den even. So, <laughs> uh, one of those mornings, I'm afraid, and I am absolutely complex, or bemused at where these creatures have disappeared to. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a little bit more success on the sunset safari. But we're going to start moving out, since there are no hyenas here. And we're discussing uh, for Dr. Debbie, the age of the Wild Earth crew. So I think, yeah, it was starts up at Eugene. This is the ground crew. Um, Eugene, and then uh, Steph, then James, then Alex, then me. Then I think Scott, Brian, Andrew, VM, are all, jean are all around the same age. And uh, turning 30 this year. Oh, you guys are catching up now, VMP. Um, and then I think Nicola is 26. Yeah, yeah Nicola, Nick, Jamie, Kirsty are all about the same age. And Louise and Jerry, I think, is the next down. 
And then David, who's just joined us, is a proper puppy at 24. And then, at the bottom of the food chain, the lowest of the low, the baby of the babies, who happens to be with us today on the back of Rusty. And VM is preparing to embarrass her immensely. She is already blushing and hiding. We have, at the award-winning 21 years old, Leanne. Smile, yeah, no. <laughs> Look at the blush coming through. <laughs> and also, the oh, hey, for uh, one of the newest members, uh, Dave and Leanne, have recently joined us. Leanne's cheeks are still red. Shame. Should we put her on camera one more time? Nah, shame. We'll leave her be for now. So, Vim? Where are the lions? Where did you chase them to? Well, we can't find any predatory mammals. We can find you a predatory bird. Here we go in the tightrope walker in search of carcasses. It looks like a juvenile. It is a, not, doesn't look like it is a juvenile battle out. Often, I have to admit defeat to the big cat, so I'm a little bit embarrassed this morning. I apologize, we couldn't find any. I shall definitely try to rectify that on the sunset safari. But uh, thanks for having fun with us and bumbling around the bush. It's been a great morning. Although, as I said, I still am very confused about where the lions might be. But let's go to James for the last bit of the show and spend some time with that magnificent elephant bull while I scratch my head in complete wonder to where the big cats have gone. Now I've got full sun. Brian? I've got power. Yeah, do you have power? I've got power. Not sure what happened there. there, go, there we... Right, so everyone. Great panic stations. From this place. We're not actually that close to him. The uh, It's called a compressed shot, so it looks like... Actually, I'm a good 150. Now, I was saying one of the great pleasures of living out here for me is the kind of peaceful atmosphere that you can derive from just sitting, just being. And when there happens to be an animal like this sitting so close to you, just getting on with his life as we are getting on with our lives, that feeling and sense of peace is just that much amplified. So I can hear the birds calling some crisp bobbits. The wind blowing, I nearly said through my hair, over my face. It's just a wonderful way to spend a bit of time absorbing the peace of the earth and the wilderness. Thank you everybody for all of your questions and comments throughout our walk today. I had a great time, I hope you did too. Big thanks to Brent, of course, and he's with VM. Thank you, Brian, for your efforts. I hope your thighs recover. And to the mystic Boer, Stefan, of course, and a big thanks to the final control of Nikki and Kirsty. We will see you later on today at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Stay safe and happy wherever you are. Bye-bye.